We are going to move from a resilience to a natural brilliant state. We're all here to move our Black communities forward. We think our children have to have the best. It's all about discipline. How are we going to discipline ourselves so that we're able to save, so that we're able to make good financial decisions? Recognizing that there's a road ahead if you manage the road in front of you. The decisions that you're going to be making today in your lives where it comes to money will affect you in the future. Discipline is one of the things that we often learn sometimes by our environment or sometimes we're forced to do it and sometimes we don't learn it at all. Stores want to get us in and out and get our money and that's it. It's a game. So you have to be really wise to the game. Do you know what it costs to run your home on a monthly basis? Land acknowledgement. As we gather together, we acknowledge the sacred land on which we reside. It has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of Dish with One Spoon Wampoon Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, this gathering place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. Last but certainly not least, we acknowledge the people of African descent who were brought here against their own will or in search of a safe place to live their lives and raise their children. Reconnaissance des terres. En nous rassemblant, nous reconnaissons la terre sacrée sur laquelle nous résidons. C'est un site d'activité humaine depuis 15 000 ans. Cette terre est le territoire des Premières Nations, Huron, Wandat et Petun, les Séniques et plus récemment les Mississauga de la Crédit, de la rivière Crédit. Le territoire était sujet de l'alliance de la ceinture Wampun plat avec cuillère, une accord entre la Confédération Iroquois et Confédération des Ojibwe et des nations alliées à partager et à prendre soin pacifiquement pour les ressources autour des Grands Lacs. Aujourd'hui, ce lieu de rassemblement est toujours le foyer de nombreux peuples autochtones de toute l'île de la Tortue et Nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir la possibilité de travailler dans la communauté sur ce territoire. Nous sommes également conscients des alliances brisées et de la nécessité de nous efforcer de guérir toutes nos relations. Dernier point, mais non le moindre, nous remercions les personnes d'ascendance africaine qui ont été amenées ici contre leur volonté ou à la recherche d'un endroit sûr où vivre leur vie et élever leurs enfants. This webinar provides illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the Black Business and Professional Association. The BBPA makes no representations warranties or guarantees as to assume no responsibility for the content or application of the material contained herein and especially this claim all liability for any damages arising out of the use or reference to or lines on such material. Bonjour, good morning. Hoping all is well with you and yours. It's a pleasure to see you again here on Community Space, the financial literacy program that speaks the language of the community. And we, I see a lot of new names and I don't see the faces, but we would love to see your beautiful faces on screen. If you can, please turn on your cameras. Let us see who's here. And we do business with who we know. That's one of the uh, phrases of our CEO. We do business with who we know. So let's see your faces if you can come on camera. Last Saturday, uh, after Community Space, we were all disrupted by hearing some very tragic news out of Buffalo, New York, that uh, a psychotic person had come into a supermarket and had um, basically 
executed 10 of our family members from our our, our, our community, our global community. And um, we, we definitely send our condolences to um, Buffalo, New York, and um, we want them to know and all of us to, to recognize that uh, an assault on one of us is an assault on us all. And that comes um, with saying uh, from people who come outside of our community to, to do things to us and also people within our community who do the same things. Um, it, it is unacceptable and um, we all have to do our best to try to not just obviously not to be victimized, but also to impart um, the the understanding and an empathy and um, recognize that we are all of the human race and to move forward. So um, definitely sending our condolences out and um, with time and with um, with support, hopefully the people of Buffalo, New York can heal. And then on that note, on a, on a positive note, we are back here again with the economist, Nadine Thompson. And uh, last week she dropped uh, millions of dollars worth of gems. Actually, it was priceless in the sense of uh, the gems that she, she dropped on us. So uh, we're here back with her today with our second segment in terms of uh, financial literacy. So good morning, Nadine. How are you this morning? Good morning, Roderick. I'm doing well. How are you? Good, thank you. It's always great to see you. And you've got one of the brightest smiles that I know. So uh, we, we talked about spiritual energy. So you're, you're just, you know, allowing that energy to reverberate on us all. So great to see you this morning. Thank you very much. Just adjust my camera a bit. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me again this Saturday morning. Absolutely. And how was your week thus far? Oh, God, my week was so hectic, you know, trying to uh, put out fires. Okay. At work, but it was good. Thanks. Absolutely, absolutely. And yours? Mine was good. You know, um, again, just dealing with some of that fallout. Um, my day to day, I work within spaces that um, try to mitigate violence and whatnot. And I, obviously, there's a lot of questions and a lot of things people can't answer on, you know, why would somebody want to do this? And we understand, you know, some of the, you know, the racism and, um, you know, and, and the hatred um, for, for people, but, um, you know, it, it's still quite the, the task on trying to, um, you know, just put our heads around and, and see how we can help people out in, in, in the sense of that healing process. So it was a challenging week, but, you know, we're here and um, yeah, we're, we're glad to be here again, just to build capacity. Right. So what are we going to be speaking about today? Okay, well, no, uh, last week we looked at, um, well, the whole series of uh, proactively navigating the high inflationary environment. So this week, last week we looked at, okay, inflation, you know, what are the drivers? How, how, are, how, how, how can we get a handle on inflation, high inflation, and who is really responsible for that? Um, this week we're looking at how we as individuals and business owners can respond in a proactive manner to this high inflationary environment. And so we're looking at it from a cash flow and risk management perspective. All right, we definitely look forward to it. And for those of you joining us today, if you've got any questions for um, Nadine, please put them in the chat or come on live with us and ask your questions. There's no such thing as a dumb question. The only thing dumb about it is not asking the question. So we're here to learn and build that community capacity. So please do chime in the chat. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen now. So I you can let me know when you're seeing my screen. We are seeing it. Okay, great. All right. We're ready to go. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, so I just want to first state, this is just a disclaimer. I work at RBC, but I'm not representing RBC in this capacity. Uh, I'm just an economist with some knowledge and experience in this area uh, who uh, wants to share it with my community and to empower my fellow um, you know, members of the Black community. And so I hope that uh, you will find the information shared here uh, valuable. And 
you may have learned about inflation in the past. It might be a refresher for you. Um, and it might some, be something new for you. Maybe there is some area you didn't understand before. I hope uh, uh, this whole uh, presentation and discourse will help to, you know, clarify those, um, those areas. And so uh, before I uh, get into this week's presentation, I just want to do a quick recap of what we did last week for the benefit of those who are joining us this week for the first time, as well as just, you know, so some of us who we, we didn't remember, we don't remember some of the stuff that was said last week or it went over our head, uh, we may be able to catch it today. And so what I also want is uh, towards the end of this session, I want us to, to have like a, a more interactive session where, you know, we're hearing from each other. How are we navigating this high inflationary environment? And, you know, so that we can actually share and empower each other. All right. Absolutely. And if I just may add before you start, Nadine, uh, for those of you who missed um, the session or any sessions um, of Community Space, um, our trusted tech person, Victoria, will be putting that link uh, for, to see the YouTube videos um, in it, she'll be putting the link in the chat so that you can go back and, and watch anything that you have, might have missed in, um, in, in the previous session. So that will be there for you today. Okay, thanks. So last week we looked at inflation, the good, the bad, the ugly, and inflation management. This week we're looking at risk and cash flow management in a high inflationary environment. So or recap, what is inflation? It's a sustained increase in prices, in the overall prices in an economy over a period of time. Uh, a simple definition is too much money chasing too few goods. And uh, inflation is measured using the CPI, Consumer Price Index, and that's what we hear quoted on a monthly basis across economies. Uh, in terms of inflation, the inflation in number that's quoted, it's quoted as headline inflation and you have core inflation. So headline inflation is that uh, number that captures every single item in that CPI basket. And uh, a core inflation is that inflation number that excludes uh, food and energy prices because food and energy prices tend to be like drivers of uh, inflation. And so uh, we just want to like look at, okay, what's the inflation number? What's the price in the overall economy without all, you know, these um, variables that can be really um, manipulative over, over the period. And just for those people who um, weren't here with us last week, the Consumer Price Index, I think it was, the CPI? Yes, the CPI, could, Consumer Price Index. Could you just uh, give us a quick brief overview of that, what that yes. was? Yeah. Yes. So we're going to do it in the recap. Oh, okay. So this is just a recap. So I'm just going to go through it quickly. And uh, so I'll capture that as well. So in terms of the drivers of inflation, it comes back down to supply and demand. Uh, so we have the demand pull and the cost push inflation. So cost push is more so on the supply side. And then you have the built-in inflation, which, okay, because you have a high inflationary environment, well, you know, people have less disposable income, well, they're gonna ask for higher sal salary. They're gonna seek higher salary. And so you see where wages also increase in the economy. Um, albeit at a slower pace than the overall pace of goods and services in the economy. So getting to Roderick's question, the CPI basket. So the CPI is a consumer price index. So it's just a, it, it, it's comprised of eight major components. So um, Statistics Canada, when they're compiling this number, um, they're looking at all the prices pertaining to the food that's in the basket, shelter, shelter is usually like rent, uh, uh, property tax, not so much like uh, the actual price of the house, um, household expenses, you have like clothing and footwear, transportation, health and personal care, recreational and reading and alcohol, beverages, tobacco. Um, 
And so there's actually a weighting that's uh, assigned to these items uh, in the basket. And you can see here that food, shelter, um, transportation, household expenses, as well as recreational um, expenses, those actually account for um, higher, relatively higher weightings. And so when you have price movements in, in, in terms of these products or components, then you will actually see um, one, depending on the weight, uh, skewing the overall inflation number. And uh, so what we, we, just, we looked at, okay, what are these components, what they look like in terms of the actual price. And so um, one of the things that I noted last week is that inflation information, it's actually, inflation is actually measured uh, like the, the number that's quoted um, in the press, it's actually a year over year number. And so for, for March, um, the, the data we had then, um, the inflation was 6.7%. And we looked at the different components that were actually driving that 6.7% relative to March, 2021. And we saw where, well, everything that consumes some, or utilizes some amount of gas, crude oil, energy, they were the, the main driving factor. So you see transportation, you see gasoline, um, and also just looking at uh, the overall uh, energy prices, you're, you see that's real, those are real driving factors. And then you also have um, food. You see food and shelter also accounting for a notable um, contribution towards the overall 6.7% that we saw in the economy. Then we said, okay, all right, most of the times when we hear about inflation, we always hear about all the negative things. The first thing we, we think about when we hear higher inflation is that, oh Lord, I don't have enough money. You know, things get so expensive. Um, so, but there is actually a good side to inflation. And well, you know, inflation, it's actually should, ideal inflation should be, you know, low relative to moderate increases over time, not what we're seeing now. And so, um when is inflation good when it is low and stable and most central banks that have inflation targeting regime they target a two percent inflation right now i don't know if you follow like japan but japan japan has had like a deflationary environment for like years and no matter what they tried they could not meet that two percent inflation target Lucky for them, they're now at that 2% inflation. And, you know, while the world is like, okay, you know, grappling with this very high inflationary environment, then you also have wage growth because, as I mentioned before, with, you know, the erosion of your or disposable income, well, you know, we're going to need to survive. All right, cutting expenses may not be enough. And so we need a bump in our salary or wages and so employers will increase salaries and uh, in order to also keep their their workers and but then most of the times the growth in wages is not really it's not equivalent to the growth in prices overall prices in the economy and if you're holding like assets um like houses or anything in your portfolio that is um, has a positive relationship with inflation, a high inflationary environment, you can actually see a growth in your portfolio, investment portfolio. So those, those are some of the um, advantages to a, having, you know, some of the good associated with inflation. And we look at the bad and the ugly, and we're saying, okay, when is inflation bad? Well, when like now persistently high. And so we see an erosion in our domestic, in our um, disposable income. Um, so we have lower purchasing power and that can actually result in lower standard of living over time, especially if uh, we're not in a position to increase our income um, and to offset the decline in our overall you know, purchasing power. It also impedes business planning and growth. There is a potential of hyperinflation, which is runaway inflation. Um, 
and it can lead to stagflation. Stagflation is where you have a high inflation, low growth um, and unemployment. Uh, there's economic uncertainty and that economic uncertainty fuels like, uh, you know, it, it, it's like it, it doesn't, uh, uh, it's not conducive for business planning, and even as a even for your personal um, planning as well. In certain, certain, if you, especially if you're considering certain major um, investments, uh, it, in, it erodes a country's international competitiveness because of the impact it has on the exchange rate. So the exchange rate tends to depreciate, and while a, a depreciated exchange rate is good for export. But you know, coupled with high interest rates and the higher cost of goods for your higher cost of inputs, then your ability to compete on the international market, especially if your competitors are able to produce at much lower prices, is going to be very challenging. And it's also it also um, makes your economy you know, less attractive for any foreign uh, direct investment as well as any domestic investment because of uh, the uh, uncertainty that can arise from, from a very persistent uh, high inflationary environment. And then we spoke about like uh, the erosion of the um, purchasing power that can actually result in lower standard of living. So you see that uh, uh, indirect uh, redistribution of wealth and usually goes into the, the wealth goes into the pockets of the haves who are in a much, advan much more advantageous position to navigate and capitalize on this high inflationary environment. And then I gave the example of Zimbabwe in 2008, where Zimbabwe had a hyperinflation and they had to um, abandon their currency because it just didn't make any sense. Just imagine your currency uh, devaluing every minute. It has no value after after a time. And so uh, the central bank had to be issuing a hundred billion dollars Zimbabwean, a hundred billion Zimbabwean dollar currency note, and that just does not make any sense. And then we looked at, okay, how are we, how, you know, well, who, who is really responsible for curbing the low, the high inflationary environment? And so uh, we, I shared that the central bank, that's really their mandate to ensure that they have price stability in an, eco in an economy. And so they are the ones who implement the monetary policy. And so that's why we would have seen the Bank of Canada increase the interest rates recently by 50 bips. And so uh, they, are at, they have direct, um, you'd say direct impact on, uh, their policies have direct impact on inflation relative to like the government and the government also can impact inflation, but in an indirect way. Uh, so the other thing um, that we looked at as well was how the policy, the high interest rate um, policy, how does it transmit throughout the economy so that we can end up having this very stable inflationary environment. And so um, Roger kind of asked this question, how long does it really take for us to really see the impact of the interest rate in the economy. And so based on what the Bank of Canada has published, they indicate that at the point, from the point they increase interest rate, it takes 18 to 24 months for the full effect of that increase to be seen in the entire economy. So just think about that, you know, uh, it's gonna take a while so the and and the high the interest rate um, increase it actually filters through four main channels and that's the commercial interest rate so that's the first part where you see that's the first impact first point of impact which is really the financial system and then you have the impact on the exchange rate and then people's expectation on inflation because okay well they what is going on in the global economy? How long do we expect all of this supply chain challenge um, to persist? And so that will also fuel people's expectation and that 
will determine how much people spend as well. And then it also, another channel through which uh, it impacts is just your just asset prices. I just got a quick question, um, Nadine. Sure. So, um, the, the federal government um, has been, I guess, noted right now to, to be speaking about inflation and obviously the, the cost of goods for Canadians and um, their conversations with the, um, the Bank of Canada. So the 18 to 24 months that um, it usually takes to see any change in that, would that also um, apply to when inflation is reduced? Yeah, so the 18 to 24 months is actually the time it takes for you to really see the desired Correct. inflation that's targeted. So for example, um, I'm not able to say, like, I don't think the central bank is really able to say, oh, this, say, 50 basis points increase in interest rates will have a 50 basis points reduction in um, inflation rate. It's not like, it's, it, it, it's, it's not like a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, so, so, but then they're able, but just based on studies and how like from the point they increase the interest rates or change, see whether they're increasing it or decreasing it based on the environment, the impact on the inflation, it takes for you to really see a dent or a change in the inflation through a, a notable change in the inflation number, it takes 18 to 24 months. Because for example, just look at, um, in, so it was in March that they increased the interest rates. Uh, the April inflation came out at 6.8%, relatively unchanged. So you see, it's not really having any impact right now. So it takes a while for you to really see any desirable impact or targeted impact. Because if, if it's going down, it's still desirable. Yeah. All right. If there's any questions for Ms. Nadine Thompson thus far, please uh, do pose them. And um, for a lot of us, this is a learning moment. So please do ask questions and learn. And uh, as we say, what happens here doesn't stay here. We, we put that information out to our communities to also impart information and education. So please do ask your questions. All right, so, thank you, Nadine. Okay, thank you. So, uh... Focusing on this week's topic now, it's uh, risk management and cash flow management. All right, I, and I'm sure everybody has been doing this, you know, in, so that we can actually survive, or not only just survive, because we want to thrive as well in this very high inflationary environment. So uh, since I presented last week, uh, the inflation numbers for April came out and we're seeing where the inflation number is like, you know, in, 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 in the economic sphere, we say it's relatively unchanged because there's not really a, the, much of a difference between 6.7% versus 6.8%. And uh, the picture that we see, um, for April relative to March, it's actually almost the same. Um, you see where, well, for April, you see a little decline in terms of the, the uh, contribution that gasoline uh, made towards um, the overall inflation number of 6.8. Uh, you see transportation, the, it hasn't changed, same impact. We see where food, and we can understand why we're seeing this higher contribution of food prices towards the inflation number. And that's because one, the grains that we, we get from Ukraine. Uh, so Russia and Ukraine are actually the combined are the largest, um, the largest exporters of or supplies of grains to the global economy. So um, so people, so, uh, and we eat a lot of greens. And so we can understand why we're seeing that in the number. So it's, it's actually ticked up a bit. Um, we also see where shelter would have ticked up a bit. Um, and um, in terms of just the overall uh, energy, well, we see where that has gone down a little bit. And 
remember earlier on I spoke about um, uh, the headline inflation versus the core inflation. So the 6.7 for March, 6.8 for April, this is the headline inflation. And the core inflation is the 4.6 that we're seeing. And you can see core inflation in March relative to April remains unchanged at 4.6. So in order for us to manage or the, the risk and the cash flow uh, or cash flow, we need to know what are some of the risks you know, that uh, we face uh, in this very high inflationary environment. And so looking at some of the personal and business risk, well, we have this high, higher cost of living, uh, increased expenses, and the potential of a lower standard of living. We have, and this is from a personal perspective, um, we have reduced purchasing power um, and so, and or cash flow and or disposable income, so not much money to go around uh, as, we, as, as we were able to before. Um, increased interest rates on debt higher cost, if we're deciding that we're going to borrow, we can expect that we're going to borrow at a higher interest rate. Um, and so, and that is because of the uh, uh, monetary policy tightening measures uh, embarked upon by the central bank. And then we have lo lower return on any fixed rate investment that we have, because just think about it, if you were getting a hundred dollar uh, every month on some investment that you have and inflation is going up and now it's at safe it's now at six six point eight percent um and say next month it goes to say seven or say eight eight point five or something you have the, the amount of money that you you have um at a, at your disposal is gonna be reduced and uh there's possible loss of employment because uh, not only individuals are, are trying to cope and to thrive in this uh, high inflationary environment, but also employers. And so um, businesses, uh, so just looking at the, the risks, some of the risks that businesses face, uh, you can understand where they may have, end up having lower cash flow, lower working capital, um, and their cost of debt is also going up if they're boring. And all of these costs of, you know, their just cost of doing business because one, raw material costs going up for them, manufacturing costs going up, all the overhead costs going up. And so they're, wanna, they're, 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 they're going to want to try and cut back on some expenses. And then they may look and say, maybe I don't need this person, you know, and I'm going to cut. So that's a potential risk that we face from a personal perspective. And from a business perspective as well, uh, there is a potential loss of customers because um, if the business is unable to absorb the higher cost then it's gonna pass it on to um, the customer, in the event that the product that the, or the service that the business produces, there is a substitute for it, the customer is gonna leave and they're gonna go and they're gonna get that substitute. And with all of these taken into account, there's a potential that the business may close if it's not able to thrive, ge generate cash flow, and make uh, even break even. It's it, it's gonna close. So that being said, uh, Nadine, mm -hmm. we have a question, and it was actually uh, what I was going to ask too, but it's from our brother Sankofa. So are we in trouble in terms of uh, seeing a recession? Um, whether that be a global recession or a North American recession um, with this prolonged high inflation? That's actually a, a risk uh, that's on the horizon. And that is why you heard, uh, I don't know if you've read or heard recently where the U.S. Fed chairman says that we're going to continue to increase interest rates until we, we have inflation under control. And so... Um, and that is because they're trying to avoid a potential recession. Because uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a risk of stagflation. And that's where you have the high inflationary environment, you have low unemployment and low growth. And so that's a risk that, um, that's on the horizon that 
a lot of central banks are concerned about and are trying to best navigate. Right. So when, <clears throat> for those people who weren't here last week, so when the central bank increases that interest rate, uh, people obviously won't be borrowing money as, as much. So that will um, put a slowing on the economy, which there thus will have, I guess, um, a, an impact on the inflation, rate of inflation, yes. correct? Yes. Right. And um, so is it like forcing the hand basically? In a yeah. sense of, right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, right. otherwise, just imagine you have this low interest rate environment persisting in a high inflation and inflationary environment. And people are, you know, people are gonna still borrow. Just, just, just look at even like the housing market. Inflation numbers started to really, you know, increase aggressively last year, uh, but then interest rates were so low that the high inflationary number didn't really deter people from borrowing. And so, uh, when you have you now the higher interest rates, a high inflation rate, well, that's a double whammy. So you don't really have like a, a lot of um, uh, disposable income to put towards like any expense that's really not essential. So we're now gonna look at combating the negative impact of inflation because um, our objective is not just to survive, but we also want to thrive, all right? And so this is more from a, well, we can look at it from a personal perspective as well as from a business perspective. And so I, I don't want to really make it very complex, but the principle of price elasticity of uh, demand, um, that's where like the price elasticity of demand, it, it, it measures how responsive your demand is to a change in price. It's like the percentage change in your demand relative to the percentage change in price. And a good that's elastic is very sensitive to, 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 to price changes. So it means that if there's like a 1% increase in price, you may actually see a 2% decline in demand. That's for like a good that's like very elastic. And then a good that is what we call like inelastic or perfectly inelastic, no matter how much the price increase, the demand remains the same. So, so in this case, you have essential goods, all right? And so you can see here where you have goods that are essential, uh, they, may, there's, they may not be inelastic, but they are still goods that we need because they're essential. And so you'll see where the quantity that's demanded uh, relative to the price is actually smaller. So you see the gap between the price change and the quantity demanded is actually smaller. And so that's uh, where these, we have to get these goods uh, no matter the price. Some people uh, may not be able to afford it. And so uh, they're forced to, to just do without it, you know? So, yeah. And then you have the non-essential goods and you're seeing where uh, the quantity demand is significantly outweighs, the fall in the quantity demand is significantly outweighs um, the price because these are just not necessary. This is like when you decide that you're gonna trim the fat. And so, and so this is from a personal perspective. Now, if you flip it and you're a business or a service provider and you're, whatever goods you're providing or services, you can expect that this is what your clients, customers, potential customers are, this is what their response is gonna be, all right? If the good that you're, and the service that you're providing is not essential, they're go you're gonna see a significant fall off in the demand for your goods and your services. And if it is essential, you're gonna see a fall off, but then this fall off is not gonna be that great. So if it was like a luxury car, you know, if you sell luxury cars, I think I saw Car Carla Cargill here. And uh, so if you sell car luxury cars, Cargill, you know, don't expect people are gonna buy those luxury cars because you know, like not as many people, only like those really rich people will do that. Um, 
So how can we best manage these key risk exposures to our advantage? And so we need to have a game plan. The, Roderick, you're waving your hand. Yeah, you know, I was just gonna have a, just a, a quick question and, and maybe you'll be getting into this. So is it better now at this point in time before the interest rates uh, go up to make these purchases, but based on inflation, obviously, because it's it's a higher cost now to purchase, or should we wait? Well, like so something like it depends on what it depends on what you're gonna purchase. Yeah, yeah, something like a house. Like again, a house obviously is is usually in in, in most cases the biggest investment that we'll be making in our lifetimes for most of us yeah. generally, right? So. I, 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 this, I, this, I think this question or came up last week, and I, and if keen on you is on here, I, I think my, 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 my response is going to be a little different from what uh, you said last week. But if I'm buying a house to live in, all right, I have to take into consideration one: what's my um, disposable income? Can I afford it uh, at this time? All right. Uh, interest rates are high now, so it's going to make my cost of borrowing, the mortgage payments, monthly mortgage payments high. All right. And uh, two, the house prices are still elevated. So the expectation is that with a higher interest rate environment, you're going to have less money, lesser money chasing the few houses that are there. Because remember, going back to the whole definition of inflation, too much money chasing too few goods because some people are just gonna be eliminated. They can't qualify for the, you know, the mortgage. And so you're gonna have less pressure from a demand side in the housing market. And so uh, if, if it were me in that position, and especially if my salary is not really growing, I would more wait because I expect that the central bank will increase interest rates some more and then house prices will eventually decline in terms of the magnitude of decline we don't know but then we're what we start based on the reports we're seeing now we're seeing where um the reports that how the housing market is cooling and so if i were if, if i were in that position um then I would want to wait, and especially given the economic uncertainty as well. So, but then say for instance, I am good. You know, I know that no matter what happened, I can afford it. Well, I would, I could do that because then if I can absorb the higher interest cost uh, and I can afford a house at this price, then I would do it. And, but then say for instance, you're, you're, you're like a, a and you're buying the property for an investment purpose. Well, I guess it doesn't really matter. Usually the principle of buy low, sell high, uh, that is what guides any um, investment principle, investment practice. Um, but it depends on when you decide to sell or when you plan to sell. Because if you buy high now, and then house prices are expected to, to, to decline and, and you want to sell a year from now, then that, that's not gonna serve you. So you have to do your um, proper assessment and get advice from the subject matter experts in these areas. And I just want to state this disclaimer, this is just for educational purposes. I'm not advising anybody on investments. Um, so, so would that be if people were going to be looking into, uh, you know, getting advice? Would it be through a financial advisor? Are are they um, apt to all of the, like, in in a sense of the work that you do as an economist, for instance, right? Would yeah. a financial advisor be privy to this type of information, or would it be uh, an economist that you would go see if you're going to be making a, a large purchase? Such as a house, which we're we're looking at, like in the in the Greater Toronto area, for instance, over a million dollars. Well, financial advisors are licensed to provide financial advice on investment. If, for example, you're my friend and uh, you're coming to me as a friend to say, "Oh, what do you think?" Uh, well, one, I'm going to be looking at the numbers, all right, and what's the outlook, 
and that and my advice will be based on that but i'm not a licensed finance and, and there's a, unless the economist is a licensed advisor to provide that i i would recommend speak to your financial advisor because your financial advisors should be getting um that information from their institution uh, the extent to which they fully understand it um i can't really speak to that um but maybe if there are financial advisors uh, in the room you can um say something in the chat on that and i think like a financial planner as well uh, can also help you um they may not fully uh, be versed in like uh, economics or, or deep economics you know but um i'm assuming that they should have some level of understanding okay great but that's where i said you can i'd say you can talk to those people but you can talk to other people who you know you know who are informed and uh, uh but don't but you know just know that when you're getting the advice from those people uh, it's because you would have consulted them and they're not really giving it to you as in a professional capacity. Yeah. Okay. And if you have a trusted real, a real estate agent, they should really know this. And if they're really, they have your best interest at heart, you can talk to them too. All right. Yeah. All right. So, so, so here we were talking about, um, um, how can from a personal perspective how can we best manage um this and this environment the risks so that we can um you know come out you know better than we started and so it's very important to educate ourselves so that we can better understand what's going on um so either we're gonna listen to some 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 podcast on on the topic um read um watch the news and i just want to say if you're gonna like listen to podcast or, or or go on youtube or whatever ensure that is really a credible source and what they're saying is really factual and it makes sense um but education is so important because how are you gonna respond in in in, in the in the best and most um optimal way if we're in, if we don't really fully understand what's going on and what we're up against and the other thing figure out what is the greatest impact to uh to your overall household um in terms of okay is this something that i can cut um or is there a substitute or if it's something that i cannot cut then what else can i cut you know so that i can even though i have to incur this higher cost you know i'm still not uh, uh made worse worse off and uh, planning and budgeting uh, that's something that well i need to improve on i don't know about you guys but I, that's something i think everybody can improve on um and then we also need to reassess our debt um and uh, because with interest rates going up well, we may end up, we may have some interest rate sensitive debt, which means that there are variable rate debts. And so the, variable, the interest rate is gonna go up, the monthly interest payments are gonna go up. And so say for instance, it's like even like you have like credit card balances, uh, think about um, trying to consolidate the debt and secure a lower interest rate uh, um, debt. Uh, and that will actually help a lot as well and well ask for salary increase um you know um we receive not because we ask not you know a lot, i think a lot of us are 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 hesitant uh when it comes on to this but you know if we feel brave enough and we really think we can ask then i think we should ask or we switch to higher paying jobs and uh, or start a side hustle or get a second job for additional income. Uh, and I think as well, it is so important that we invest in ourselves, like education, skill sets, because then, you know, in every, um, you'd say adverse situation, there is something good that came, 
can come out of it. And I think once we invest in ourselves and you know learn new skills, it also increases our earning potential. And in terms of like your portfolio investments, I'd say, you know, invest in high yielding assets, um, but just bear in mind that higher return normal, is normally associated with higher risk. So if you're a risk, if you don't have a risk appetite that is, uh, you know, open to higher risk, then I'd say stick to, to safer investments. It's just that the safer investments don't give you that return that will actually outpace any inflation or offset the negative impact from inflation. And I'd also say just diversify your investment portfolio. So because uh, you, 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 it's, it's never advisable to have a portfolio where everything is the correlation between everything is the same. If, say, for instance, inflation is going up right now and you have uh, items in your portfolio that are, they respond positively to a high inflationary environment, which means that the value is actually going up, just think about it when inflation tapers off. Everything's just going to go down and you're going to pot potentially lose all of that uh, return. So diversity in your portfolio is also very good. And from a business perspective, uh, education is also at the top of the list because it is so key. You have to understand it. You have to understand what, what, what you're facing. And it's also important to educate your employees because if your employees are advising you, they also need to advise you properly. If their employees are making decisions uh, on your behalf because you would have delegated uh, certain responsibilities to them, they need to also better understand the uh, environment uh, within which we're operating. And it's also important to understand the value chain and its exposure to supply chains. So most of the times uh, when we think about, okay, well, we hear about the supply chain constraints uh, and we're more so thinking about, you know, our supplier and, or, you know, are they able to really get the goods to us? But that supplier is also dependent on another supplier and that's the other supplier depends on another supplier. And so it's so important for us to, to actually go to those, try and understand the source because uh, once we're able to understand all of those links and the potential exposure that's associated with, uh, with, with each of those players, then we're able to better position ourselves as businesses. And that will also in, will, will factor into like budgeting, the planning, the forecasting, and inventory management. If if you're like a, if you produce a product, um, and also I think it's at the, at this time it's also very critical that if you produce a good what or a service, assess how well it is performing. Is it something that you can continue to provide over? say the next, uh, until the next year, all right? And if it's, for example, your only product, maybe you need to think of our service, you maybe need to think of diversifying because if it's not performing well in this high inflationary environment, it, you, you face the risk that you may actually go out of business. And so uh, assessing the profitability, profitability of uh, the SKUs and our services is so important and improve efficiencies. Now is the time that we have to think about all you know, the inefficiencies and ways that we can do things better within our organizations. And so that will also help to reduce the cost. So we're trying to reduce cost and we're and while at the same time trying to see how best we can increase our cash flow, we can increase our, our, our revenues. And Similar to like, a, you know, if, from a personal perspective, it's also good to just consolidate your high interest bearing debt and, uh, and see how you can get locked. Like right now, fixed, fixed rate debt is like very attractive because, you know, you want to lock in um, a relatively lower interest rate. And, and especially if 
the expectation for interest rate is going to be uh, much higher than the fixed rate debt. And so that is something as business, uh, you know, we need to consider. Like, if you want to retain your client as well, and, you know, you realize that you're, they're really challenged by this high inflationary environment, then consider offering payment plans for them. Um, the other thing as well, the cash conversion cycle. So while we're thinking of offering payment plans, you're like, well, how does that make sense when you're saying try and reduce your cash conversion cycle? Well, we have to try and see how best your inventory, how from this, the money that you invest in the inventory, you can get it back from your clients through that whole cycle. And so if, if, for example, you're offering, um, say, payment plans to your clients, uh, as well as trying to see how you can reduce your cash conversion cycle, it's a, I think it's a, a delicate balance that uh, needs to be managed very well. And uh, just maintaining healthy and ongoing communication with your clients, your customers, because uh, you don't want to lose your customer during this time. And also you have to bear in mind that the customers, they're going through the same thing. You know, um, they actually may be in a worse off position than you as the uh, entrepreneur. And uh, just keeping morale high within your organization. If, if you employ people, that is so critical because just think about losing your key employees um, and in an environment where the job market is so tight uh, that's going to be a, a challenge for you and just investing and reinvesting in your business that is uh, critical as well so these um, uh, these uh, these are the suggestions it's not an exhaustive list but these are things that we can consider, you know, as we think about how we can best manage these key exposures that was discussed before. Project, you had any questions? Yeah. So a quick question. So, for instance, a, a business owner, um, if there's a profit, obviously everybody has a profit margin when they're selling products, right? Um, if they were to make the decision to decrease the profit margin. So if the profit margin initially maybe have been, you know, $5 on each product and they were to say, okay, we'll, we'll take a $2 reduction, right? It will obviously impact our bottom line, but in the sense of keeping your customer base and being able to maintain that base, is that something that um, I guess um, business owners who are ethically um, inclined to, to serve community and then look at profit margins, obviously, but not as their only basis of doing business. Is that something that some of them do? I would think some business would do that. But Roderick, when you talk about um, reducing your profit margin, it does not necessarily mean that the, the price that the consumer pays is actually reduced. So it could be that the um, business their cost, their inventory cost, uh, just the cost of producing the good is higher. And instead of passing that on to the customer, they absorb 100% of that cost. Uh, because one, pricing your product is, is it's so important because just think about it. Your price is a reflection of the value that, of your product. And if you were selling at say $50 and now you drop the price and you're saying it's now at $45, like, you know, just think about the customer psyche and what they're gonna think. They're gonna say, hey, you really, you, you used to charge me $50 for this? That means it's still the value that's associated with that product in the customer's mind is, it, it has declined. And is that something that you want from a business perspective? So that's why I was saying that um, if the, um, the business decides that they're gonna reduce their profit margin, it would be more so from the perspective where they're absorbing the cost, maintaining the cost that the price that's uh, charged, that, that, that they charge the 
customer right rather than reducing it yeah, yeah I, I guess there is um the potential risk of, of that but then i think a lot of times when things are high people look for for sales for bargains and everything else also so that i, I guess it, it all depends on it depends on the product then if you have right. a sale yeah. but then but if you're having a sale roderick is the price that you're gonna offer during that sale is it going to be much lower and so different from previous sales that you used to offer but that's just my perspective people can put in the chat you know their views but that's just my perspective in terms of uh pricing and the, the psychology of, of pricing because when you're pricing there is a value that you're communicating with your price so another question and um, a lot of us here, for instance, on, on the chat or sorry, on the um, the Zoom this morning are from the Caribbean, for instance, right? And, and we know when inflation um, is, you know, on the rise it, in the Caribbean, it even is that much more costly in, in the sense of the, the cost of living, right? So is this an opportunity, for instance, I, I can speak from Barbados, is, is, you know, the home of my parents. And um, having the ability to say grow vet fruits and vegetables in Barbados, but obviously just based on agreements and arrangements, you know, a lot of our vegetables and fruits get shipped in. So, you know, that, that apple that you may be paying $5 a pound for now, now becomes obviously eight or $9 a pound for, you know, for apples. But, you know, we can technically grow them ourselves, maybe not apples, but you know, whatever, right? But is this now an, um, an opportunity for, say, countries of the Caribbean to be able to you know, promote and build within, right? And, you know, cut off some of those external resources that we've been bringing in so that we're not having to pay for transportation. We're not having to pay for all of those things that are helping to inflate the prices even more so. Is this an opportunity? Definitely. It's definitely a really great opportunity for countries to to look internally um so a few years ago uh in jamaica uh there was this um campaign about eat what you grow grow what you eat and uh, um just think about it potatoes we call it irish potato in jamaica uh, you know, but, but in Canada, they say potato uh, because, you know, you don't want, it's like an offense to the Irish people. So I don't know why I'm like, okay. Yeah, but the government had implemented, because Jamaica was importing so much Irish potato, potatoes, all right? And uh, like the numbers were really staggering and you're like, really? And so the government decided that they were going to promote the growing of Irish potato and reduce the um, importation of Irish. So that could have come through higher tariffs um, and stuff like that. But that's what happened. But it's always an up because these islands are so import dependent. And so uh, a lot of import inflation is, is, is being, um, important in the economy on top of what's already there so that is why it's even much more costly uh, for for foods for goods and services in those economies and so if the government they're able to to to, to implement policies um you know allocate funds to support these like the agricultural industry and and maybe more target not and maybe more targeted production of certain goods food items that would be really great all right so we've got a question from our brother sankofa good morning sankofa how are you good morning um by the way nadine i want to thank you for giving us some of the um economics 101 um but me me being a, a a world historian kind of asking the same question. So we know that the economics and all of that is a Eurocentric model, whether it's laissez-faire, whatever 
they're talking about. So the question I really have, WTO, the, the United Nations, all of these organizations that controls economies, the global economies, WTO control trade. The fact that Ukraine is, do, is sending grain and Africa and the Caribbean have so much fertile land because I'm sure when I was in St. Elizabeth, the dirt red, and when I was in Barbados, we have some of the greatest soil. And when I was in Trinidad and Ghana, Togo, Benin. So will it like, because these things are, are recession, a lot of them are man-made and they're psychological, a lot of it. And it's used to control the, the so-called third world or I call it the black world. So how can we start to develop our own economic system our own idea of what inflation is, you know, because at the end of the day, the people who control the world are the ones who dictate. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I know it's, it's big, but I'm interested in the big idea. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, so last week uh, I shared that the CPI index that's used to measure inflation is not perfect. It's not representative of the consumption basket of every single household within an economy, but it's the best measure to date. Um, and so to answer your question, if say these developed countries, developing countries are able to come up with a better measure of inflation, then that would be really good. And, but another thing that I need to note is that the standard for measuring inflation is an international standard. And so just imagine if Jamaica was measuring their inflation differently uh, relative to the rest of the world. Nobody will really want to trust Jamaica's inflation number because Jamaica can overstate or understate the number. So say Jamaica comes up with uh, a much better measure of uh, inflation so that it can capture um, the, the, the expenditure across the economy. Uh, and we're talking about, in terms of inflation, we're talking about the consumer price index. We're not talking about the other measures of inflation like the producer price index. Uh, it's more so the one that's, that's, that, that, that we all focus on. Um, so unless we're able to come up with something like that, then I think then we'll be able to, and we're able to, it is credible and it can be applied across economies then I think that we would be in a better position. I hope that answers your question. Um, Sankofa. Saka, Saka culture, I think that's it. We know him as Sankofa. Kofa, okay. Well, yes, all right. Yeah, all right. And so, um, so I just wanted to share this. So coming from um, the, the, the previous slide where we talk about how we can best navigate and you know how, what, what, what risk response we can have. So I mentioned the point about communicating with your, your clients, uh, showing empathy, um, you know, and just this is an opportunity for companies to build their brand loyalty and their brand power. And so this, this chart here just shows you all right, products that are that have strong brand loyalty in a high inflationary environment, the fall off that they experience is actually lower uh, relative to those that don't have a strong brand loyalty. And so that is why as, as businesses or business owners, it's important um, that we build that relationship with our clients because as, as as, as you know, it's often been said here uh, by the BBPA that, you know, your brand is really what your customer says about you. So just 
think about it. You know, if you didn't treat your customers very well during this time when they really need, they really need you, they really need your support and your empathy. Um, when times are good, they're not, they're just gonna turn their back on you. So uh, it's very important that we build uh, brand power and brand loyalty as part of our uh, res res let's say response. And so the last area I want to touch on is just on investing. So uh, from a personal perspective, as well as from a business perspective, um, you know, we, we should all consider, you know, how, how can we benefit from this high inflationary environment through investment. And so right now, um, the high inflationary environment is, is, is more so supply driven than demand driven. So we have high demand, higher demand relative to um, the COVID period, uh, but then the supply growth hasn't really caught up with the high demand that we have seen. And so hence why we have this um, problem. And so uh, some ways in which we can invest. Well, if you're thinking of like financial assets, you can think about like fixed income investments. And this is information that I, I took from BlackRock. And BlackRock is, um, it's an investment management company uh, that uh, their clients are more so institutional investors, but the principles that they share applies to any individual as well as say small, medium um, size business. And so uh, inflation linked bonds, because just regular, what we call it like plain vanilla bonds, um, they don't do well in a high inflationary environment because one, you're getting, especially if it's like a fixed rate bond, you're getting a fixed re return. So the coupon rate on that is fixed. And remember, as I shared before, you're getting that fixed return, inflation is going up. That's actually eating out like the real, um, like your disposable income, because at the end of the day, you don't really have as much money to spend or to reinvest if you decide to reinvest. And so inflation linked bonds are those that are tied to inflation. So inflation is going up now. So the return that you get on your bonds, it's actually, it goes up. So it's like positively correlated. And you also have unconstrained strategies. So unconstrained strategies is where uh, it's like, the inflation interest rates can go in any direction, but you're still uh, able to benefit. And uh, then you have equities. So I should note that not all stocks, um, their value appreciate during an, a high inflationary environment. So it's very important to identify what are those stocks that thrive in a high inflationary, high interest rate environment. And that's where your financial advisor comes in. So um, investing in stocks is, uh, is also an option. And then you have real estate, uh, keen on you, I hope you're here. So uh, keen on you, the, uh, they, they, they actually provide um, education on real estate investment. So, uh, you can talk to them as well. Um, but then real estate, that's, that's also an option for you to invest. I know Roderick had asked earlier about, okay, when is it time to invest? But I said, you know, it's based on your disposable income. Uh, what are your targets? And even if, for example, you're investing in real estate to say resell, it also depends on the time within which you plan to resell as well. So those are factors that uh, have to be taken into consideration. And then you have commodities. Uh, well, food going up, oil going up, everything commodity related going up. So commodities, these are like good um, investments right now. Um, so you have what you call commodities futures. Uh, so these are where you're actually, you, you agree on a price today 
and at maturity you 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 actually sell that futures but then you're for a futures contract you're not really taking delivery of the physical commodity it's done on an exchange and so this is a way in which uh, you're able to also invest and make money and you also have commodity related uh, equities that you can invest in and this is where like an investment advisor the, 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 the role of an investment advisor comes in here because they are supposed to be really equipped to, and inform on the different options that are available and that's it so thank you very much i hope uh, you found this session beneficial um you learned something um you if, if you knew it before it was a refresher for you and uh, i hope uh, uh, it helps you to uh be in a position to better navigate this high inflationary environment all right thank you very much nadine thompson for all that information again uh, lots of information um lots of new information for I, I can probably say for the majority of us but here's the the time we can ask questions so everything you wanted to know about inflation um let's ask it right now while we have our economist nadine thompson with us here this morning on community space so you can drop your questions in the chat or you can ask them live and um, so Roger just to add so earlier on i had said that uh, i wanted to hear you know i wanted the session to be much more interactive and so it would be really great to hear uh people's view in terms of what what are they experiencing what um uh actions uh you know they have taken to navigate this environment so we can all benefit from this discourse right so I mean, I, I can uh, just share a little bit about myself. So um, prior to this uh, time and period um, where inflation has, you know, basically soared, uh, we I started to build a, a house, um, with, you know, a family house, and um, you know, obviously we know that you know diesel and gasoline has gone up, so it impacts you know the transportation of of goods like you know steel and lumber. So we've definitely seen that. Right. But, um, you know, I was just talking with the builder yesterday and and, you know, basically he was saying what Sankofa, Sankofa was alluding to is that, um, you know, it, it is psychological because now in other industries, <clears throat> excuse me, that are not impacted as much as like, for instance, lumber and steel. Right. You know, everybody's doing the copycat thing. Right. So everything is everything has gone up and it, even in industries that aren't again, impacted. Right. So um you know obviously there's nothing really much we could do but um that being said i, I think you know when we look at our, our our caribbean countries as i was talking about earlier there is great opportunity right now for us to hopefully um see past to the immediate the surface and look in in terms of long-term um decision making and and having things more insular as opposed to relying on everything for you know <clears throat> our, our our countries to be fed or to be serviced obviously certain things will have to be still coming in but um the other things we we should definitely you know hopefully see the opportunity to to break away and, and to be much more self-sufficient because um obviously when uh, our, our economies our, our black economies are impacted by um external forces you know we even bear the the, the brunt of the the punch that much larger and it hurts more so i think you know this is an opportunity and not just for caribbean countries but even here within you know north america what can we do as a community right to to build now in these days and times where we can hopefully continue just to impact a new narrative on on how we can do things So that was a, a comment slash kind of question. So what can we do now as a community? Where can we have like food? Like obviously we know now in the summer months and, I, and I, I'm, I'm using 
a couple of examples. So I know we've got um, uh, you know black, some black farms even here in, in the, the the GTA um, that provide farming and, and whatnot. So obviously that can have an impact on the cost of fruits and vegetables, for instance, right? But what are some of those other areas that we can as a community can do so that we can have more self sufficiency and not have to you know necessarily pay the the out of the sky prices or you know or have some impact that we're padding ourselves a little bit more what are some of those economies that we could do i think you're on mute now lady thank you um so well, you mentioned one, like food, that's so important. So if we were just to go back to the uh, CPI basket um, and what is it that we can really, which one of those um, uh, mm -hmm. components we can really, um, it, it's easy for us to, to find a solution for. Well, food is one, but um, I'm not sure how easily that's going to be like now in the summer months you can do your backyard garden your front yard garden whatever mm -hmm. and that will help uh but one of the things that i was thinking that would be really good for canada because like almost every food we eat and fruits we eat they're imported i'm like why don't we have much more like uh greenhouse greenhouses you know like farming um taking place so uh, that's like an, an opportunity that exists that uh, you know can be pursued uh, that's gonna require some initial outlay in terms of capital so if you're able to secure that funding that's like an option okay. um well uh the other thing is in terms of and i'm just looking at the cpac basket so that's how i'm discussing mm -hmm. Um, transportation all right we don't need to drive everywhere so if we're able to walk that's good because then walking or uh, or even just take an alternative what's a substitute we can take the public transit if that's a, a good substitute based on where you your you, your destination is so that's something that we can do to help ourselves um well i can't really talk about clothing because clothing and footwear because in terms of their contribution to the overall inflation is like very negligible um uh, energy is that's like uh, energy. We, we, well, in terms of the production and the sourcing of energy, we can't really, we don't have control over that, right. but we can control our consumption of it. And so even in our homes and our businesses, like turn out the light, you know, <laughs> like simple little things like those uh, because they add up. Um, so that's uh, the, like a practical thing that can be done. So, um, but then I think Roderick, uh, uh, what is key and what we need to do is to educate ourselves and understand what's going on so that we can become more solution oriented. All right. And on that note, we've got uh, two questions. So let's start with Carol. Good morning, Carol. How are you today? Oh, good morning. How are you? Um, well, I just, I just wanted to offer a couple of suggestions um, with respect to food. There are community gardens available um, that people can join and participate in, and uh, grow food and uh, share what they've created and share what other people have created. Um, but another thing that I was thinking of in terms of how we can help ourselves is to get together and invest in property. Um, this inflation which we always have is not necessarily something natural. It's man-made and created. It's a way to transfer funds from the poor to the wealthy. And it's just been accelerated during this particular period. But what's happening is that the value of property is getting extremely high. Like in Markham, um, properties are going up over 40% per year. So if people were able to come together and invest as a group into properties, that would be one way in which they can um, reap some of the benefits of inflation. Absolutely. 
that's that's really a good suggestion, Carol. Uh, a friend of mine who does um, real estate investment, he says, you know, one of the things that uh, the black community doesn't really do well is, you know, collaboration. So you have like uh, uh, the other communities, um, you know, they invest in properties, they group up and they invest in properties, but in the black community, there's too much mistrust. So I think if we're able to overcome that barrier first, and there are ways in which we can overcome, you know, the mistrust, then I think that will help a lot. Right, and um, I think that goes again back to Sa Sankofa's point, and a lot of this is psychological and um, understanding where that mistrust has originated from and uh, being able to, of course, correct that, hopefully we'll be able to then build capacity in, in the sense of trust. And then obviously there, there's no lack of money or dollars in our community. It's just how we spend that money and how we don't spend that money within our, our community. So I think um, you know, learning that from the ground up will hopefully help us in, in the uh, in, in the long run, when it really boils down. Another question from Amanda or comments. Good morning, Amanda. Hi, good morning. Um, so it's not really a question, but uh, more of a comment. Um, like Nadine had mentioned, she wanted this to be more of an interactive uh, session. So one of the things that I actually got out of this, Nadine, and thank you so much for the information, is as an individual, like I'm like we need to get a better handle on like our money. Um, so in terms of debt, trying to pay that off at this point instead of accumulating more. Um, so one thing you mentioned today is like the consolidated loan for, let's say, credit card debts. I think that's a really good idea. I actually um, was able to uh, do that a couple of months ago. And I find that with the loan, like once you're paying the money on that, you're not spending it as opposed to you keep uh, paying a credit card, but then you're going to you have like an option to spend it, right? So with that loan, you're paying it off, but at the same time, you're kind of keeping control of your credit card limit and not spending it. The other thing too, I think during this time as a community is we need to think about obviously our consumption, right? And what are what goods are necessary and what are unnecessary. Um, so I think that's another thing as an individual we need to think about and then just um, I think Brother Saka, I I, sorry if I mispronounce your name, you talked about, you know, this being a Eurocentric economy and whatnot, and, and, and that is true, uh, but for the time being, before we can come up with a solution that is more beneficial for the community, I think as um, Black people, we need to invest more in our businesses, so businesses that are Black-led, Black-owned, so that's one of the things that I've done intentionally in the last two years is really trying to find those businesses that are black led and black owned and invest in those businesses instead of investing in businesses that are already well established, white owned or Asian owned. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your comment. So we've got a couple um, pieces in the chat. So sourcing from Africa is the solution and the way to develop that uh, motherland full of talents, uh, eco-friendly, sustainable bioproducts, transit time to ship stuff is less than shipping from China and wages are low, less invest in Africa and value the made in Africa brand. And um, I definitely would subscribe to that. Um, and, and we always see, you know, it's easier said than done. Um, in the sense that um, you know, manufacturers deal with manufacturers basically, and and um, relationships, <clears throat> excuse me, aren't as easy as as one, two, three to develop and to um, sustain on on long term basis. But you know, nothing tried, nothing gained, one hundred percent. And 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 often, you know, sometimes it goes, you know, with best price, right? You know, in terms of just being competitive in the world that we live in. And uh, another comment is, I was thinking about buying a new car because the price of used cars are going through the, I guess, roof with inflation. But this meeting has encouraged me to reconsider and be mindful about how I use their money. 
Okay, so uh, we're getting people definitely to think and, uh, and, and sometimes as we know, um, deferred gratification is, is something that we all have to work on and, um, and, and sometimes waiting it out. And, and, and obviously I'm not a financial advisor, but um, waiting things out are, are, are often a process that we can take just to make sure that um, you know, we're, we're not jumping while it's too, too hot. So we don't get burned, right? Last words from Nadine, <clears throat> excuse me. Last words from uh, Nadine Thompson. Well, thank you very much, Roderick. And thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, how can we reach out to you first, Nadine? Uh, people are asking how we can reach out to Nadine Thompson, number one. Oh, well, um, you can reach me on LinkedIn. I'm going to just copy and paste my um, information here. OK. Um, so that everyone can see it. Um, but yeah, but I really thank you very much, Roderick, for uh, giving me the opportunity to share uh, with um, you know everyone. Um, as I was sharing to, with Victoria, I was saying, you know, I, I attend the Boss Women program, the uh, Community Space program, really great uh, topics we talk about, but you know, I saw where we needed to talk about something like this. And uh, in my work, you don't really have like a lot of black representation. And even when we do our outreach through RBC to the youths, the people who are attending our, our sessions, a lot of them are not black students. And so we're thinking of how can we really reach uh, or community so that we can educate them and inform them. And, and so I'm like, you know, I have this, you know, knowledge and experience. Why not share it with my community so that I can help to empower and so that each person who would have attended the session learned something and they can share it with somebody else and they can share it with another person. And so that's how we help to build our community. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And uh, Thank you very much. I just want to say the last thing, the, the one thing that's always certain is uncertainty. And every day, there's always an opportunity. Just think about it. Somewhere, some, somewhere, someone somewhere is creating something. You see all of this, the challenges that we're facing now, all the green issues, you know, the shortage. There's somebody else who is thinking about, okay, how can I solve this problem? So we need to also become solution oriented with our thoughts and try to capitalize on these opportunities. So let's not become overwhelmed with the challenges and say, oh boy, things too expensive, life too hard. You know, let us rise to the occasion. And so that's what I want to leave everyone with that, you know, there's an opportunity for us not just only from a personal level, uh, but also from a business perspective. And so thank you very much. And thank you very much again to all of you uh, for joining us on another session of Community Space, the financial literacy program that speaks the language of the community. So uh, please do join us next week, same time, same place here on Community Space. Take care, be safe, and Power to the people, 100. Community Spaces, the financial literacy program that speaks and reaches the community. Are we going to be in a better place or are we going to be still quote unquote behind the eight ball? Because of the historical disadvantage that our community has, we most times do not have financial role models. Without that, economically and financially speaking, we'll always be at the bottom. Keep proper books and records because the data drives the strategy and the strategy drives the profits. COVID-19 sort of removed a veil. It's really exposed the structural barriers that our communities face. These last two years where there's been a heightened emphasis on the well-being of Black people has influenced the influx of funds and opportunities. The time is now. How long is that window going to be open? We'll see you next week. And don't forget to tell a friend to tell a friend to join us here on Community Space.